Great. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to be covering a couple of topics that at first seem a little bit unrelated, uh, presbyopia and focus cues in virtual and augmented reality. But before I get into the actual details of both of those things, I'm going to describe vision, because we need to define what normal vision is, and before we describe how visually impaired things work. And so when I say normal vision, uh, what I'm really talking about is emetropic vision for people that are younger. And how this works is your eyes are able to refocus through a relatively large range of distances from optical infinity to somewhere very close, let's say 10 to 25 centimeters or so, depending on your age. Um, and when people think of visual impairment, they often go to nearsightedness and farsightedness. And how nearsightedness and farsightedness work is that there is a single shift in power, usually caused by uh, some refractive error in your cornea, for example, or the length of your eyeball, that causes you to focus things um, to the wrong distance. And this effectively results in a shift of the entire focusing range a little bit too close or a little bit too far. On the other hand, presbyopia is a thing that happens to all people, even primates actually, as a function of age. And how this works is that there's a crystalline lens in your eye that sits right behind the cornea. Um, and it refocuses for you uh, when the muscles around it bend the sac that it's in. Over time, though, the crystalline lens actually hardens because the proteins that make it up kind of degrade. And this results in something called presbyopia. A lot of people think of uh, what happens with age as getting farsighted. And actually, farsightedness is different. And it's possible to be nearsighted and presbyopic far-sighted and presbyopic, and also emetropic and presbyopic. So they're different concepts, and uh, it's a lot harder to correct presbyopia with a single lens because you're not just trying to shift that range around, you're trying to somehow expand it. So before I continue on about how to correct presbyopia uh, with our autofocal technology, I'm, I want to just have a little brief aside about how we'll relate this to virtual reality. So presbyopia is about a small focal range in a world that has a lot of different distances that you can focus to. Whereas virtual reality, the problem with focus, focus cues is that you want to be able to support a person who can focus through a lot of ranges in a virtual world that really only has one focal distance. All right, so back to presbyopia. Let's say you have this sort of a scene. You're sitting at a desk reading a magazine, and um, you're presbyopic. This is exaggerated for effect, but uh, if you're presbyopic, you can easily focus on everything far away, and then something that's within arm's reach might be a bit blurry. One way people solve this issue is by using reading glasses, and you just put them on when you want to read, and you'll be able to see everything close up in sharp focus, but then everything far away gets blurry. So then you have to take your glasses off again when you want to see far away. So to solve the inconvenience, a lot of people wear bifocal lenses or progressive glasses. The way these work is they kind of split up your field of view such that the top half is for far away distances and the bottom half is for closer distances. And then as you move your head up and down, you kind of get all the distances in between. Um, but you know, effectively, you can never really see clearly everywhere in your field of view at once because your glasses have been kind of segmented up. If you decide instead to segment up your vision such that instead of doing top and bottom, you do left and right eye, uh, you get something called monovision. So the idea here is that one of your eyes, usually your, your dominant eye, is set for distance vision, and the other eye is set for near vision. And the hope here is that your brain uh, will just intelligently combine the sharp focus images from whichever distance, from whichever eye, and then kind of get a little bit of stereo cues from the other eye, even though it's blurry. And this does work uh, for um, presbyopic correction. Some people don't really like it, but it's an option. Another thing people do is they wear multifocal contacts. The idea here is that you either have diffractive lenses or concentric circles of lenses that are all at different powers. And you get a, an overlaid sort of image where all of the different focal distances are represented at the same time. So you see a bit of the sharpness and a bit of the blurriness together. But we don't like any of these. Uh, we want a natural solution. And when I say a natural solution, what I mean is a solution where if you're looking at something far away, far away is sharp. And the moment your gaze turns to something close, it focuses close. And this is how younger people are used to focusing. They just look around, and things just happen to be in focus. So what have, been peop what have people been doing up to this point? 
Well, there's a couple of different research projects and a set of companies that are all working on the problem of automatic correction for presbyopia. At this point, though, um, the companies either have products that are in development phase or there's no automatic control. And as far as research goes, the most automatic control we have is a depth sensor that looks straight out ahead of uh, straight out ahead of the user's head, and whatever is directly in the center of their field of vision is what's going to be focused. And if they turn their gaze, nothing changes. So it ends up being more of a head tracked sort of uh, way to do refocusing instead of an eye tracked way to do refocusing. So what we want to do is something we're calling autofocals. And the idea here it looks like a VR headset because it's using a lot of the same VR optics. Uh, but the idea here is that we use an eye tracker to measure where your eyes are, a depth camera to measure the world, and we use both of those together to update focus tunable lenses. And these lenses uh, basically change their focal length using a liquid membrane on the inside. Uh, and that liquid membrane tends to be affected by gravity, so we have a coma corrector to kind of adjust for that. And lastly, because people have different prescriptions and you can be nearsighted and farsighted and stigma astigmatic, all while being presbyopic, we have, some, we have an offset lens holder so we can account for that. OK, so how do we actually make this all work? Like I said, we have two eye trackers. And uh, if you have two eye trackers, what you can do is have a gaze point on the screen at some distance that you've already calibrated. And you can measure ahead of time the IPD, or interpupillary distance, between the two eyes. If you have these, these points of information, then you can kind of triangulate how far away someone's looking because the rotation of your eyes does not change with, with age because you want to be able to see a single image instead of a double image. And so this is called vergence, and we can estimate the vergence distance and use that to update the lenses to the right focus distance. So how does this work uh, in, in actual practice? So as you see here, there are three distances that are marked off, uh, 2.5 diopters, or 40 centimeters, 1.25 diopters, or 80 centimeters, and 0.167 diopters, or six meters. And these three distances were our reference distances. And we had a person wear the autofocal headset, and we just used the vergence estimate. As you can see, it doesn't quite match up with what you'd want it to do. Uh, in fact, it looks like there's just an offset uh, where it's shifted down by a certain amount. And why does this happen? Well, there are a few different things uh, that we had to set ahead of time, and any one of them could have gone wrong. So first. If your IPD was wrong, then you're triangulating from a different eye position. That could give you an error. If you estimated the gaze points wrong on the screen themselves, that could give you an error. And lastly, if you said you were going to calibrate the screen at 50 centimeters away uh, when you put it on, but you actually calibrated it at some other distance, then your estimate would be wrong that way. When you do the simulations for how much this effect would affect each thing, it turns out IPD, even if you're wrong by 5 millimeters, um, and for reference, most people's IPDs land within uh, 55 to 70 millimeters, so 5 millimeters is a huge error. Um, pretty much nothing changes. If the gaze is off by 1 or 2 degrees, you actually get a pretty large error. And uh, eye trackers tend to have a, a resolution of around 1 or 2 degrees, depending on how good it is. And I think the theoretical limit for a calibrated eye tracker is actually around one or, or 0.5 to 1 degrees because of the size of your fovea and how much you need to, uh, how much your eyes will actually move as you're calibrating. And so this is definitely a significant source of error that you can't easily get rid of. And lastly, uh, if the calibration distance is wrong, um, you get an error that increases as the object gets closer, but it's still not a huge effect compared to the gaze error. So to solve this, we uh, go and look at the depth sensor. And the depth sensor, we used a real sense. And this is the sort of depth map that I want. But as you can see, there's a lot of holes in the depth map where you see all the black regions. And we want to fill this in because we want to always have depth information. It turns out this isn't a super important task for us since we already have emergence information. So we're just going to do the easy thing and in-paint it with uh, Navier Stokes and painting. And you can see here there's a little point that uh, appears to be very, very close, even though it's off in the background. And in this case, we were lucky, and it didn't actually cause a bigger error. But you can imagine cases where the in-painting does fail. And so this is also not a perfect method, and there are better ways to do it. But it's not important for our, our case, basically. So back to the, uh, to the estimation. We're going to be doing sensor fusion first. Here's the vergence estimate that you saw before. 
And then if we use that depth map and then index into it with the eye tracker locations, then you get all these blue dots. Um, and as you can see, we're actually hitting the exact reference distances that we wanted to, but we have all this noise with the blue points uh, that aren't quite where you'd expect them to be, especially for the closer distance of 2.5 diopters. And so the first thing we do is just do some heuristic filtering to toss out a bunch of those. And then uh, what we want to do is rely on the divergence estimate because it's running on a 120, 120 hertz eye tracker, whereas the real sense is only 30 FPS at best. And so you want to keep the speed of the faster system, but the accuracy of the slower system. So what we're going to do is exponentially relax the error of the divergence towards the value of the depth tracker. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, you have a lot of the high frequency information from the divergence but you kind of match the exact distances that you want from the depth tracker. Uh, it turns out that all these little high frequency wiggles are visible and kind of distracting. So we actually slow it down even more and prevent it from updating unless there's at least a 0.25 diopter shift in power from where they were already focused. Um, for reference, 0.25 diopters is roughly the step in which people prescribe uh, prescription eyewear. And so it's a difference that's basically fairly noticeable. OK, and this is what it looks like when you look through uh, the focus tunnel lenses uh, as someone looks back and forth. So we're, we're looking through with the camera in this case so we can see both lenses, and it focuses between the two distances as someone who's controlling it looks back and forth. And then here's what it looks like on someone's head uh, where they look around. I don't know if you can notice in this video, but the lenses do actually change as uh, the wearer looks around. Uh, and focuses different distances. And it is a tethered system because uh, there's a lot of computation that we can't currently do on the headset itself. But since we have it on users, we want to be able to study how it affects users with the user study. To do this, we set up a system with three different displays at those three different reference distances that I referenced earlier. And we've set it up so that all the displays line up perfectly at eye level. And the sizes of the letters we display on, the, on each display are calibrated such that they subtend the same visual angle. So the tests we do, uh, first, visual acuity. And that's just a word that means sharpness. And really, it's just the same as an eye test that you have at an optometrist. The letters get smaller, and you keep reading them until you get more than half of them wrong. We tested this visual acuity on two groups of people, uh, one that typically wore progressive lenses, and another that typically wore monovision correction. And we measured their acuity with their own correction on, and then wearing our autofocal headset. So as you can see, uh, with their own correction, there is a clear trend uh, as you get to closer distances of acuity falling off. And though progressives do maintain better than 2020 acuity, there's still a clear trend. But monovision, on the other hand, you get worse than 2020 acuity at closer distances. And this is because the, uh, the two eyes are at different focal lengths. And if they're too far apart in focal length, you suffer from lower stereo acuity. And so instead, uh, you decrease the amount of difference that you have between the two eyes, which means you can't get as close anymore. On the other hand, autofocals don't exhibit the same obvious downward trend with closer distances. And they maintain well above 2020 acuity at all. So we move on to a different sort of test. Uh, here, uh, it's a letter matching task performance. There's one letter on both of the two screens that we uh, had them look between. And we just have them tell us a very simple thing. Are these letters the same or not the same? And if they get it right, we'll count it in their favor. And if they get it wrong, they get it wrong. We measure two things, how fast they went and how accurate, how accurate they were. Again, uh, we did this for progressives and monovision users and compare that to autofocals. So the first thing you, should, you can notice is that autofocals uh, perform slightly faster than their own correction in both cases. For monovision, this is because uh, it's blurrier at the closer distance, so they have to try a little bit harder to see what the letter is. For progressives, this is because to refocus progressives, you actually have to tilt your head up and down to get the right distance in focus. And because this is a slower mechanism, it was, in fact, so slow that in order to keep up any semblance of speed, they had to uh, take a huge hit in, in the accuracy of their, of their letter estimates, uh, which was statistically significant in our case. The last study we ran with the autofocals was one of natural user preference. And here, we uh, took it to SIGGRAPH last year. 
uh, to their emerging technologies. Um, we forgot to take a picture of our booth, but it's right here near the entrance. Um, and we asked them three different things. One, how comfortable was this headset? Two, how easy was it to refocus when using it? And three, how convenient do you feel this technology to be? So uh, again, here are the responses for their own correction, and here it is for autofocals. As you might imagine, a VR headset is less comfortable than wearing glasses. Surprise. All right. Uh, but the important things uh, are the ease of refocus and the convenience. And as you can see, people definitely preferred the autofocals for ease of refocus. And convenience, they did have a slight preference. And this can be attributed to people that are wearing progressives generally go to a, through like a weeks to month long process of getting used to their progressives. And once they're used to it, it's not that much less convenient. It's that month long process that we want to want to be able to avoid. On the other hand, we also had people that wear reading glasses. And for them, it's definitely more convenient. We actually tossed in a third mode when we ran this study uh, that I'm calling depth track only mode. And the way this worked was we just ignored the eye tracker, only used the depth camera, and only used whatever object is directly in front of them to kind of simulate the other state of the art technologies where they use the depth, just the depth sensor. And in this case, we see that people thought it was way less easy to refocus. And because the refocusing ability wasn't as good, the, convenience, uh, the perception of convenience also suffered. So in conclusion, uh, we built this autofocal headset, and we measured a lot of the perceptual um, uh, acuity and task performance metrics that we would want to know to see if this technology is currently viable in its current state. And our conclusion overall is that, yeah, the focus tunnel lenses and the eye trackers are totally capable of, of doing um, correction fast enough and accurately enough to uh, improve vision. It's mostly just a matter of increasing the reliability, reducing power, weight, et cetera. So let's move on to how this all relates to virtual reality. So as I said earlier, if you have presbyopia, you can see stuff far away clearly, but not stuff that's close. And that's because the real world exists at close distances, but you can only uh, focus at far distances. On the other hand, in virtual reality, the virtual world only exists at a far distance in most consumer VR headsets today, whereas a typical VR consumer is able to refocus through a wide range of distances. And you might ask, why not just always focus far and leave it at that? Because they can focus far. Why ever bother having them focus near? Turns out there's a problem. And for that, I'm going to go into a little explanation about VR optics and focus cues. So, this is a typical uh, setup for a VR system. You have two eyes behind magnifying lenses that look at some sort of a micro display. And what happens is this micro display gets magnified out to a distance of D uh, based on the thin lens equation uh, for whatever focal power the lenses are at. And when you look through this system, you have two different focus cues that we care about. Um, one is the vergence cue. And the way this works is your eyes rotate in and out to create a single uh, fused image between the two eyes. And this is driven by binocular disparity. This is provided by VR displays because you can easily give completely independent images to both eyes such that they have the right parallax shift between left and right. On the other hand, uh, there's the accommodation cue, which is the refocusing cue. And this one's driven by something called retinal blur. You can kind of think of this as working like a uh, digital autofocus for a camera. It also turns out that these, uh, these cues, because they act together in the real world, are neurally linked to each other so that they help drive each other faster and more, more uh, accurate. As I said, in the real world, these cues are linked. So whenever there's an object moving back and forth, you're always verging to the distance of the object, but you're also accommodating to the distance of the object. When you look at a VR display, on the other hand, uh, you're forced to accommodate to the distance of the virtual image in the display, but you're free to verge in front of or behind it based on the binocular disparity that the displays are, are uh, showing. And this ends up giving you something called divergence accommodation conflict, and it causes headaches, eye strain, and generally just a uh, lack of comfort in VR headsets. So one way you could solve this is to actually just straight up recreate the 3D scene in front of the viewer. And there's a few different ways people do this. First, uh, they use multiplane displays. So this can be temporal multiplexing, spatial multiplexing. But the idea is that you have multiple different display distances that you can focus to, and you just pick whichever one is closer to the right vergence distance. 
There's an extension of this called focal surfaces, where you assume those multiple planes are not actually planes at all, but rather uh, warped surfaces of some kind that have been optimized based on what you're looking at. And then there's the light fields and the holograms. So with light fields and holograms, uh, what you're looking at instead is a, an attempt to recreate the actual light that's entering the user's pupil. Sorry. Um, with a light field, the idea is that you're trying to recreate the light rays that enter someone's pupil based on ray optics, whereas holograms are sort of the wave optics model of it, where instead of recreating light rays, you create the, recreate the wave fronts of light that enter your pupil. Both of these um, are more of research topics at this point, and in terms of practicality, none of them are quite there yet, and they're a lot harder to implement, miniaturize, and do with low computational cost. So instead, what we worked on was presbyopia correction-inspired solutions. And so there are three different uh, topics that I'm going to touch on. First, monovision, which is inspired by monovision, uh, and you just assign the two eyes to different distances. Accommodation invariant, which is inspired by multifocal lenses, and here you overlay all the distances at once. And lastly, adaptive focus, which is inspired by autofocals, and here you automatically update the distance of the virtual image based on what you're seeing in the... Uh, Oh, got it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, in the um, in the scene. Okay. So, in order to test all of this, we wanted to actually have a bench chop setup because it's a lot easier to iterate, and test multiple different things, and uh, in general, just play with different modes. Our particular setup has two 2K LCD panels for each eye two focus tumor lenses that can independently update the distance of the virtual image for each eye, and then a cold mirror or near visible, near IR visible beam splitter that reflects the virtual image into the user's eye while allowing uh, IR light from the auto refractor to measure the accommodation state of a person's eye. We also have a translation stage for IPD correction. Um, and again, IPD is intrapupillary distance. So first, Monovision. So the idea behind monovision is that you're going to give the left eye, for example, a close virtual image, and the right eye a far virtual image. When someone's looking at a close object, the left eye would see it in sharp focus, but the right eye would see a blurred image. On the other hand, when somebody looks over to a far object, the right eye would see it nice and sharp, but the left eye would see a blurred image. And the hope here is that the brain would automatically switch between the two distances and refocus based on whichever one gives you less of a conflict with the current vergence. I'm going to skip to the, to the punchline on this one and just say, turns out it doesn't work so well. In our testing, we kind of saw that people tended to uh, pick a distance based on whatever they focused on first and then just kind of stay there the entire time. So I'll move on to the accommodation variant display. So the idea here is that we're going to assume that uh, accommodation is driven primarily by the retinal blur gradient. And so you can see these uh, point spread functions, or PSFs, on the side here. And if you're focused at the correct distance of the virtual image of the screen, one meter, then you have a nice sharp PSF that's a small point. If you focus further away from it in either direction, it gets blurry. And so the theory is that your eye will drive the focus state towards the sharpest plane and then stay there. Now, back to the focus cues. Remember, we said uh, earlier that uh, binocular disparity and vergence can drive ver uh, is nearly linked to accommodation. So what if we just turn off the retinal bl blur cue entirely so that there's only the binocular disparity and the vergence left to drive accommodation? Well. This could theoretically work. There is, uh, there is research about a uh, AC to A ratio, ratio which shows that people's uh, accommodation can be driven to an extent by how much they're verging. But how do we actually remove the blur cue? There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, you could, for example, use a pinhole uh, contact lens so that you don't have any depth information because pinholes give you a perfectly in focus image everywhere. But that loses a lot of light. So instead, we implement this with the focus suite. And what we do here is we have the focus tool lenses as before, and we drive them at 60 hertz. 60 hertz is fast enough for most uses of being able to drive it faster than the, or the flicker fusion threshold of the eye. 
And what you end up seeing on your retina is a superimposed set of Gaussian blurs um, for all the distances together, which at the end kind of looks like a more spread out Gaussian with a sharp peak in the middle. What does this actually look like when you look through the display? Well, on the left side, you have the conventional display image, uh, which has one focal distance. As you can see, very blurry. The accommodation side, uh, of invariant side, a lot less blurry. You can actually make out a lot of the, the sharper details. As you focus to a distance that's closer and closer to the ideal virtual image of the screen, you can see the conventional image gets sharper and then blurrier if you focus further away. On the other hand, if you look at the accommodation variant image, it's basically not changing at all. And you can see this bear out in the PSFs that you saw before, the conventional display. Uh, the PSFs change a lot, and there's a sharpest point right where you're supposed to focus. But the accommodation variant display, on the other hand, the PSFs pretty much look the same at all the distances. None of them are quite as sharp as the sharpest image on the, or on the conventional display, but most of them, or all of them, are better than most of these distances. Okay, but maybe we don't want that little bit of extra blur, so we're going to try to do some PSF engineering. And what works in our favor here is that not only were these PSFs depth invariant, but also laterally invariant. And that means that we can try to deconvolve it. So in order to do this, first we took a camera, stuck it inside the VR display that we built, and we measured the PSF. Once we measure the PSF, we're going to assume that there is a user in the system viewing some image. And the image formation model we use is that this image gets convolved with the PSF that we recorded on the camera, and then this results in a slightly blurry sort of halo-y image with some sharp features. What we want to do is deconvolve the image. And um, usually when you think of deconvolution in image processing, it's you've already captured the image and you want to make it as good as possible. On the other hand, here, uh, instead we have a image that needs to be deconvolved before it actually gets convolved because you can't actually do anything after the light has still left the display because the only thing that's going to happen after that is it's going to get to the user's eyes. This actually makes the problem a little bit more difficult in that you uh, can't go above 1 or below 0 because you can't have negative light and you can't go brighter than the display. So that makes deconvolution less than perfect in this case. But when you apply it, you can actually see it's, it's hard to see in the smaller image, but there is a little bit of detail that you can recover. Um, I'm going to blow it up for, so it's a little bit easier to tell. So here's the target image. Here's what it would look like in a conventional display, fully focused. Here's what it would look like out of focus on a conventional display. And then here's what it looks like at pretty much any distance in an accommodation invariant display. Um, again, I don't know if it's easy to see here, but a lot of the, the smaller details, like the feathers, actually do come back in the accommodation invariant display. That said, we do want to be able to test if this actually works when you uh, put it in front of a person and actually allows them to accommodate to different distances, because this is all just a theory. And so to test this, we gave them a couple different tasks. The first one I'm calling the sinusoidal task. We took a target and had it move back and forth dioptrically between 0.5 and 4 diopters and told them, just follow the target with your eyes. Here's the stimulus, sinusoidal, uh, four di or two plus, or two mi plus or minus 2 diopter range. And here are the results for somebody looking at a conventional fixed focus display. All of the smaller gray lines that you see are individual traces that show uh, individual accommodations. And the thicker blue line is the overall average accommodation. I do want to note that the auto refractor we use is in no way time synchronized with the display. And so this lead that you see in the accommodation doesn't mean anything. But um, if you compare that conventional to the dynamic, uh, where dynamic is us dis uh, updating the display to exactly the right focal length, you can see the dynamic does a lot better. But the conventional did have some response, and that's actually because of the neural link between the accommodation version systems. So you're seeing a little bit of what's left of that. But we really want to take advantage of that link and make it a lot stronger by get, getting rid of that incorrect blur cue. And so this is what it looks like when they use an accommodation variant system. As you can see, it's somewhere in between the two, which at first doesn't seem great, but uh, this A to C, AC to A ratio actually isn't usually one. It's actually below one in most people. And so this actually makes perfect sense. You can see there's some people that actually, if you look at the gray lines, uh, accommodated quite well, and then other people for whom it maybe didn't work as well. 
So just to confirm that this wasn't an effect of predictable motion, uh, which allowed them to refocus, we wanted to give them a slightly different task where we gave them static targets that would just randomly appear after a black screen at uh, 0.5 diopter increments between those priorly tested distances. So the ideal response we want to see is that if we put a target at one diopter, they would focus at one diopter and so on. Here's what it looks like with the conventional display. As you can see, there's a little bit of change due to that neural linkage, but it's basically flat all the way through because they're continually trying to accommodate to the far distance of the virtual image. On the other hand, when you use a dynamic display, the curve almost exactly matches the ideal curve. And then here it is with the accommodation variant. So again, it's somewhere in between, and this is because the A to C A, A ratios are different. Uh, but we can conclude that it does work, but only for a limited set of people, depending on how their vision system is set up. So we move on to adaptive focus, or the autofocus sort of solution. So the way we address the VAC with adaptive focus is we move the virtual image in time with the vergence distance that we're stimulating them, with, stimulating them with for the binocular disparity. And I want to remind you that this isn't actually correct, because if you look at the real world, things are at different focus distances simultaneously, whereas in this case, everything is at the same focal distance at any given time. It's just that focal distance is updating. So it really is a question of whether that incorrect but almost correct thing works. We gave them the same exact task as before, uh, the sinusoidal task, where the target moves back and forth between 0.5 and 4 diopters. And here are the results. So first, stimulus. Here are all the individual traces for the user responses. And here's the overall average. So exactly like before, for the conventional display, we see some sort of a residual leftover gain. And then for the accommodation, uh, or sorry, the accommodative response and the adaptive display, you have a much more um, realistic response that actually has a lot of the same properties that you would expect for a general population in the real world. Just to split it up a little bit more though, we did separate the, the data by age, and you can see that there's this trend of decreasing accommodative gain as a function of age, and this actually verifies that our system works exactly how we want it to, because if you look at prior studies that do this with real world targets, they have more or less the same trend with more or less the same numbers. But we also wanted to see how this affects the visual perception of the display. And so we gave them the static targets task again, but instead of measuring their accommodation, we gave them a qualitative questionnaire of how sharp is the target and can you fuse this target? So the first thing, sharpness, uh, we split the users into two different age groups, below 45 and above 45. And for sharpness, we see that the below 45 crowd can actually see a sharp image for all the distances in either mode, and they're totally happy with it. On the other hand, for the presbyopic users, they can see a sharp image at any distance with the conventional display because the focus is always far, but the moment you give them an adaptive or dynamic display, uh, as soon as the, the, the distance becomes a little bit too close, the sharpness drops a lot. And so therefore, you can conclude that VR for older people is different than VR for younger people because they're, the way their focus systems work is, is different. In fact, conventional VR as it exists today is better for older users than actually doing some sort of a light field or hologram sort of thing. The other results we had for feasibility show why having a Verdon's accommodation solution is better for younger people. And so if you look at the traces here, you can see that dynamic actually lets them maintain pretty good feasibility at all of our distances but conventional shows a very significant drop-off as a function of distance. Interestingly, when we looked at older users, we also saw a drop in distance, but it's nowhere near as pronounced. Um, and we think this might be due to slight aberrations in lenses. But because these two are actually different from each other, we know that there is an effect that is lens independent. OK, so we did that all on a benchtop setup. But we want to actually you know, test this in a more realistic environment. And so we implemented this using a Gear VR and then retrofitted it with a stepper motor that could move the phone screen back and forth and a pair of eye trackers from SMI that would allow us to know where the person is looking. When you uh, put this all together, 
and update the distance of focus. This is kind of what it looks like. You can see the uh, display going back and forth. And then if you look through, you see this uh, simulated gaze target. And when the gaze switches to something close and then back over to something far away, you can see that the focus of the scene shifts. And then we refocus it with the camera to bring it back into focus. And of course, we ran a user study on this, because of course we do. Um, and we did four different scenes. So the first two scenes, we had a lot of objects that were both close and far away. And we had them uh, tell us what they preferred between the conventional mode and the gaze contingent mode. Here we see that there is a strong preference for the gaze contingent mode because of the increased comfort. On the other hand, if you have a lot less depth variance, so things aren't quite as close, then the effect is still there, but it's not as pronounced. And lastly, if you put everything far away in a scene such that there is nothing close up, then the effect completely disappears, which is exactly what you'd expect. So therefore, we can conclude that adaptive focus actually does work for everybody for whom it's intended to work. Um, and when you have a Presby Open VR, you just have to remember that not everything is best for this, or not everyone has the same best visual setup. So I want to thank my collaborators and co-authors. So Robert is my co-author on most of my papers at this point. Uh, Emily was a professor that is now at Berkeley for which who, with whom we'd worked on a lot of our earlier projects involving Presbyopia and refocusing. And Gordon is my professor. And of course, my entire lab with whom I've done a lot of work and they've helped me out. And that concludes the talk. It was based on these four different papers. And I will open the floor to questions. Thank you.